Good afternoon, and welcome to the Jernix webinar titled, How to Survive a Compensation Compliance Audit. My name is Claire Augustine, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. We respect your time, and we'll have you back to work in 30 minutes. A few housekeeping items. Since you're attending this webinar live, we'll be sending a follow-up email to all of you that will include a PDF of today's presentation, as well as additional resources. Next, you can expand the screen for better viewing of today's presentation using the percent icon on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. And finally, you can submit questions online anytime during the presentation via the Questions tab. I'll be collecting your questions as the presentation goes forward and reading them at the end during our Q&A. Our agenda today will be quite straightforward. First, Jim Jetson will take us through the webinar, and then we'll begin responding to your submitted questions during the Q&A. And now, let me hand you over to Jim. Claire, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here this afternoon. I am real pleased to have an opportunity to share uh, some of the experiences that we've had with some of our clients with regards to uh, compensation and surviving a compensation order from the CCP. Uh, to all the attendees, I'd just like to say, uh, uh, once again, um, HR3D is a compliance and compensation solutions provider. And if you do have any questions after the presentation, I, I'd be happy to take your questions and or uh, take any emails you have regarding um, any questions concerning information we discuss here. So uh, let's just go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, if, the first thing I want to talk about is the scheduling letter audit notice. So CCP. Uh, will send out a scheduling letter audit notice, and in that notice, they're going to ask for a number of particular items. Why does somebody get an audit notice, um, and, and how, and what should you do to respond? Uh, uh, are items that uh, are not part of the, uh, this particular webinar, but really, what I want to, what I want to focus on is um, the documentation requests, the response times, and the quality of your responses, because that's going to make the big difference. Uh, the OFCCP documentation, they're going to request your affirmative action plan data. They're going to request compensation data. Once you get the audit notice, you're going to have to respond to them within a 30-day period of time. And the quality of the response that they're looking for includes some very, very factual and detailed information concerning your current operations. Uh, there's a difference in between the uh, um, audit letter for 2011 the 2012 audit letter has not been approved yet by OMB, so they're still working on the 2011 letter, off of the 2011 letter. And uh, what you're going to be asked for is going to be for AAP data for the couple of years, all your compensation data for all of your current employee population. And uh, so that this will then be the uh, beginning of the, beginning of the uh, information that you're going to have to provide for them. So the audit framework, the OFCCP audit framework, historically, OFCCP has been focused on employment actions and hiring. Uh, for example, if you know, there's a disparate impact on uh, green people or yellow people, or if there is a disparate impact uh, uh, in terms of uh, the number of applicants that you process or the number of versus the number of hires. Uh, the new audit focus is, is now um, on compensation discrimination. And basically what they're going to be looking at is, for individuals that are in the same job title, they're going to be looking at any, any salary difference of $2,000 or more uh, between those two individuals. And uh, they're going to be interested in having you rationalize and explain to them why there is a $2,000 difference or more. Now, it's perfectly natural you can do that. Um, but if you don't have uh, a compensation program put in place or a compliance thought about your compliance previous to the time that you get an audit notice, you're not going to be prepared, and you will have extreme difficulties getting through a compliance audit. So uh, Claire, if you could launch the first poll question, that'd be great. All right. Our first poll question is, have you or your company ever been through an OFCCP audit? So please select one. OK, so while we're waiting for the results for that, uh, I'll continue on and just tell you very quickly, within this audit framework, many of the issues include lack of, uh, lack of analysis on the information, lack of documentation, uh, no data, uh, 
to be able to present to OFGCP. Uh, and um, that really, it really begs the question of you know, it's really necessary to prepare and get started uh, before you before you get your OFCCP letter. We're going to take just a minute to take a take a look at a gap analysis. That is, you know, what, what areas you need to look in today to try to project where you've got to where you have holes and where you need to start thinking about preparing for your OFCCP audits. Prepare your results for that first quarter. Yes, hundred percent said no. Okay. I would encourage you, if you do not have, uh, AAPs are required by organizations that have 50 or more employees uh, in any one location, or if you have a federal contract worth $50,000 or more, I would encourage you, if you don't have a, an AAP plan in place, uh, to either look into it or find a vendor or uh, a, a try to make arrangements to, to get yourself situated with an affirmative action plan because um, you're, you, will, you will need it uh, for a number, for number of reasons. Okay, so let's take a real quick look at a gap analysis. Your gap analysis is based on your scheduling letter review. Uh, what the, the kinds of things that OFCCP is asking for you for. Once you do that, you have to begin to do a little bit of strategic planning to help you figure out uh, what you need, what you have, um, where to get what you need quickly, uh, the required timeline for completion, and uh, the additional data that you're going to have to pull together for uh, in order to be able to uh, meet the compliance uh, documentation requirements um, that they're asking you for. Uh, the, uh, one of the things that we want to really zero in on is your compensation uh, compliance platforms. Uh, contractors today, small to mid-tier federal contractors generally do not have, their businesses are not large enough to have their own compensation people or their own compliance people like some of the larger ones do. Consequently, they will either have a tendency to maybe ignore or just put on the sidelines the needs for a compliant compensation platform or program. And uh, that will work for you maybe if you have one contract, but, but when you sign that second or third contract, you're going to run into major problems uh, because that, that, that platform that you're using of the individual contracts is a burning platform. Um, it, it, it's based on lagging indicators. It, it, it increases your potential exposure for uh, salary differences because contracts just frankly pay differently. You could have a software engineer on one contract being paid completely differently from a software engineer on another contract, and yet when you try to rationalize those two salaries, um, you're going to have to explain what the difference is. And what we normally recommend and what we do with our clients are national market pricing survey basis uh, platforms where we benchmark all of the jobs, okay. and then the contractor use that as a platform for their um, to be able to do their bids and proposals on, to be able to do other compliance work on, to be able to respond to OFCCP. So they have a uniform platform um, that they that is based on national market pricing survey data. So that's um, just kind of a real quick uh, thumbnail of the difference between a couple of different compliance compensation platforms. Uh, before we go on to the next slide, uh, I'm wondering, Claire, could you uh, go forward to the next poll question? Our next poll is, does your company have a current affirmative action plan, yes or no? I think that was the first poll question, wasn't it? Uh, our our first poll question was the OFCCP audit, and then, okay, and then our second question, affirmative action plan, 60% say that they do, 40% okay. say that they don't. Okay. All right. Thank you. So let's move on. Uh, what does a compliance model look like uh, for, for your organization, or how can you start conceptualizing where, how, how, to, how to pull this information together? We'll start with the compliance, compensation compliance infrastructure. Uh, which is the job codes, job titles, job grades, regions for the salaries for your, that your employees are working in. Uh, once you have that compliance infrastructure, you, you then can start with an implementation where you basically map your employees into appropriate job titles, job grades, uh, and to determine whether or not, um, from a job title perspective, uh, their compensation can be looked at uh, as a as uniformly. Um, um, 
So for example, you might have one job, a software engineer with a bachelor's degree and two to four years worth of experience. Then you might have another software engineer with a bachelor's degree and three to five years worth of experience. You then need to map your employees into those particular categories. Uh, and only then can you start comparing the salaries to determine whether or not you have any disparate impact salaries for your, you know, for your employees. But once you do that, you then can go through a, uh, a review and analysis of all your data. You can take whatever corrective actions you need to take. And then you're prepared to give a compliance response back to OFCCP. Um, but you have to go through those items uh, before you give that compliance response. Failure to do that, it's, you could be setting yourself up for a um, uh, for disparate impact challenges back from OFCCP just simply because uh, you, you, you weren't sure what your data was that you reported and, and what OFCCP might be able to potentially challenge you on. Um, did you have results for that, for that second poll question? Oh, yes, right. You said 60 percent, didn't you? Yes. It was 60 percent say that they did have an affirmative action plan and 40 okay. percent say that they didn't. Okay. All right. Let's take a look real quick at the compliant compensation infrastructure. So we've been kind of talking about that versus a, a running platform basis, basis, uh, versus a, a, a business building platform. Your business building platform um, uh, compliance infrastructure will provide a number of pieces to a puzzle here. It'll have job titles, your FLSA status, it'll provide job descriptions, it'll give you your EDO1 codes, um, it'll give you, you know, a good compliance compensation infrastructure will give you coal ranges for different cost of livings in the country and the salary ranges. Um, and then what you see on the outside of this slide, your RF, RFP labor category pricing, GSA schedules, AAP and EEO1 reporting, all of these items are driven off of a compliant compensation infrastructure. Recruiting support, uh, performance plans and merit budgets all become a, a sort of second nature to the company once you've got a, a good cohesive compliance uh, compensation infrastructure in place that you can start that you can start building uh, your uh, your organization around. Uh, okay, so the gap analysis that you need to complete. What is your what is your compliance compensation infrastructure look like? Uh, do you have a sustainable compensation infrastructure? Can you complete a compensation analysis? And can you respond within the within the thirty day period of time? And uh, can you provide factual information to uh, to the federal government or to OFCCP uh, for uh, in response to the questions? More specifically, uh, once you have all these, once you have an infrastructure, you need to make sure your employees are mapped. You need to make sure that you conduct an internal compensation audit. Uh, you need to discover any potential pay discrimination. And as I mentioned, OFCCP by job title will say. It challenge you if you have any more than a, a two percent or a two thousand dollar difference in salary for those individuals within the same job title. That doesn't mean that you have to pay everybody the same. What it means is that you have to be either to explain it, either by years of experience or credentials or advanced uh, academic credentials or uh, or certifications, or you've got to fix it uh, so that uh, that there aren't any differences. Uh, so that's really a, a major focus on uh, taking a look at this. Uh, another employee pay analysis factors uh, include um, the start date. When did the employees start? When was the last salary action that they had? Uh, what is their academic uh, experience? How many years of experience do they have? Do they have, special, do they have special clearances? Do they have any special certifications that would lend themselves toward higher pay levels? Uh, uh, once they have all that, then you can slot them appropriately into a job grade, into a job code, and then start comparing. Um, then start comparing the challenges, I mean, the uh, the compensation, salary, by race, and gender. Uh, can you ask the, the last poll question for us, please? Yes. Our last poll is, if audited today, do you think your company could provide the required compensation information? Yes or no? Okay, so looking at pay challenge responses. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, be prepared to explain the $2,000 or 2% 2 difference in salary for the same job title or grade. Factual data responses, for example, um, you, you wouldn't want to, if, if you're challenged, you wouldn't want to respond back and say, well, this one has more responsibility than the other one. 
um, because they're going to ask you to explain what that means, but you need to be able to say, yes, this one has six years of experience, this one has 10 years worth of experience, this one has a, a, a BS degree, this one has a BS degree and a master's degree and a PhD, uh, this one has a, has a, has a, is working on a program that's worth 30, 30 million, this one's working on a program that's worth 5 million. That's the sort of factual data responses that OFCCP is, that and auditors are looking for in order for them to be able to rationalize uh, specifically whether or not you, you have given them uh, sufficient documentation or justification for uh, why there's a difference in individual salaries. Uh, and uh, Claire, would you have resp the uh, response for that, for that poll question? Yes. So 80% said yes and 20% said no. Okay. Well, it's good that, uh, you, uh, that you have a confidence level with regard to being able to uh, provide the sort of documentation that RFCCP is looking for. Uh, shows a level of preparedness that uh, that OFCCP is looking for, and they'll be delighted to uh, to, to receive their information. Um, we want to talk a little bit about threat response strategies. Uh, when you get an audit, uh, there are several things that you might want to consider, regardless of, of what you're what you're providing for them. Um, first thing you have to understand is audit the auditors probably will not necessarily have a clue about your business. They won't necessarily know how you make business. I mean, how you make money, whether you're a services provider, whether you provide hardware or software or whatever it is that you're doing for the government. Uh, through my experience, the auditors pretty much come to their audits without a lot of knowledge concerning uh, who they're auditing or how they make money. So you need to take that into consideration when you start responding to an auditor. Uh, secondly, you want to provide factual documented responses. Auditors are trained to check off boxes. Uh, they have, if they have a logical explanation for why some, if they find an error and they point it out to you, they're looking for a logical, factual explanation as to why it is the way it is. Um, and if you can provide that for you, for them, uh, they're going to be more than happy to check off that box and move on to the next item because they're under time pressures as well. They've got to get a certain number of audits done, and they're looking for situations where they can really dig in and. If somebody doesn't have what they need, uh, be able to dig in and find out why and, and get those items fixed. Uh, next item is good clarification on, uh, on additional information requests before responding. Um, if an auditor sends you, calls you and says, hey, I'd like to have such and such, uh, uh, ask them for it in writing and make sure that you understand everything that they're looking for and what the request is before you respond uh, because it, it, the, the, Everything is kind of capsulized if you take a look at the last bullet, which is answer the mail. You want to give the auditors as much information as they need. You want to give them what they're asking for. But you don't want to give them so much more that they don't have, you know, that they're going to have more that they now need to start digging into uh, to, prolong the, to prolong the length of the audit. Uh, so those are some of, the, um, some of the real quick highlights with regard to um, audit response strategies that you might be thinking about. Um, with regards to uh, an OFCCP audit, comp predominantly a compensation audit. We currently are supporting about a dozen contractors that are currently undergoing OFCCP audits. And uh, so we see, a, we see a number of different responses from OFCCP and uh, uh, a number of different requests from OFCCP and, uh, and understand what they're, what they're looking for and, and specifically how to respond to them. So I would just encourage you, if you are under audit or if you have some questions, you know, to well, feel free to call or um, you know, make an inquiry because we'd be happy to um, help you with uh, whatever situations you might be facing. And uh, that kind of brings us to the uh, end of the presentation. I want to leave it open. I know we covered a lot of information at a fairly high level, and uh, and I, what I really wanted to do was open it up for questions. Uh, uh, so, Claire, I'll just uh, turn this back over to you or to see if anybody has questions I'd like to have answered. Thank you, Jim. We'll now start the Q&A portion of our presentation. If you haven't already done so, please submit your questions via the Questions tab. Our first question comes from Eric. Eric asks, can I use commercial or government contract titles to do my compensation analysis? Uh, you, uh, by commercial uh, contract, uh, commercial titles, I, I assume you may be talking about uh, from survey data. Um, I, whatever, 
you, you can use, certainly you can use survey data. I would use certainly more than one survey to, uh, to validate your findings. Um, when you talk about using contract, company contract compensation data, that's the, that's the area that I've talked to about the burning platform. Here's the problem with that. If you have one contract, it's not an issue. If you have more than one contract, they're going to have to do an analysis on each and every one of your contracts, and you're going to have to do the disparate impact analysis on each individual and that job title for each one of those contracts. So the amount of analysis that you have to do is double to triple, depending on the number of government contracts that you have. And um, it's been our experience that the government will, will take those, take that information, but they're going to then ask you to provide additional documentation concerning the pay in those particular government contracts. Uh, and they're going to go back to the agencies and verify that, in fact, that, they, that the contracts are paying that much. So I would be cautious about using contract job titles, although it can be done. Thank you, Jim. Our next question comes from Serena. Serena asks, if my company has 100K in contracts but only 25 employees, do I need an AAP? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, you want to be prepared. Uh, you want to be prepared and, and, and understand uh, kind of where you are with your affirmative action plan. The, the requirements for this are for um, individual con individual sites of 50 or more employees and uh, contracts, uh, government contracts worth 100,000 or more. So you, you don't have to meet both thresholds. Um, if you have contracts of 100,000 or more, and then you have sites with individual sites with 50 or more, you have to have a plan for each individual site. But you do have to have at least one plan for your uh, for your 20 employees. Thank you, Jim. Our next question comes from Chuck. Chuck asks, in your opinion, which new audit changes are the most critical? Uh, Craig, you broke up a little bit. I didn't hear you. All right, the question was, in your opinion, which new audit changes are the most critical? Um, clearly, the ones that are causing the most problems are the new enforcement actions that OFCCP has put in place. And those enforcement actions include uh, the new, you know, uh, some new announced uh, uh, program changes, uh, OFCCP uh, sometime in 2012 is going to be launching a, a web portal uh, that so that um, federal contractors will have to submit all of their compensation data the same way that they're currently have to submitting all their EEO1 information. And if you send information into this compensation portal and you don't know what it, and you don't know what you're sending them, if you haven't done an analysis, you could very easily be setting yourself up for some of the disparate impact challenges. Um, with regard to um, OCCP analysis. The other thing I would say to you is um, there is a, there's been a long-standing program. That's, 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 there's a, a, an item out there called the National Pre-Award Registry. Uh, this is the Pre-Award Registry is a, is, a, is a registry that OFCCP maintains so that anyone that has passed, recently passed within the last two years of an OFCCP audit successfully goes under this National Pre-Award Registry. So anytime the government gets ready to award a, a defense contract or a government contract, the contracting officers are now required to go to the Pre-Award Registry to find out if the company has passed an audit in the last two years. If they have not, then uh, that OFCCP will be sending um, pre-award audit notices to those particular contractors uh, in order to be able to get them audited in a, in a pretty, pretty quickly. So, uh, and then lastly, the third piece is that OCCP is also talking about requiring your compensation data to be submitted with any new RFPs that you're submitting to the government for any new work that you're doing as well. So it's going to come and it's going to come quickly and it's going to come fast. So you, you just really need to think about the preparation for it and, and getting ready for it. Thank you, Jim. Our next question comes from Nathan. Nathan asks, how long does it take to implement a compliant compensation plan? Well, that depends on the size of the organization. We've had uh, we've had some clients that have come to us um, that had nothing in place. They did not have a compensation plan in place, and in fact, they didn't have even a affirmative action plan in place. 
uh, companies, you know, they should have had these things in place, but companies that are 200, 250 employees, uh, you know, with, with a great amount of urgency, we can get a compensation plan for an affirmative plan put in place in under 30 days so that they could respond, so they could respond to an OCP audit. Under normal circumstances, I would say you probably would be looking at about 45 days, about 30 to 45 days in order to implement, uh, effectively implement a, comp a compliant compensation program, depending on the size of the organization. Um, you know, larger companies take a little bit longer just because there's, there, there are more employees to map once the infrastructure is established. Thank you, Jim. Our next question comes from Lily. Lily asks, can you explain a little further marketing pricing? Market pricing, excuse me. Sure. Sure. Market pricing is, uh, market pricing is, a, is a concept uh, that uh, many federal contractors, all of our clients, uh, have, have embraced. And market pricing uh, basically is, is a compliant infrastructure that's based on well, in our case, we maintain about 29 different national market national market surveys uh, that come from commercial companies, that come from federal contractors, from manufacturing firms, and we extract all of the uh, we extract all of the job titles and the salaries and the uh, associated with that, and then we build and then we build an infrastructure um, uh, with similarly situated job groups, like for human resources and finance. Uh, for logistics uh, on the administration side, and then on the technical side, we'll do it for the IT group, for your systems engineering group, maybe software development engineering, intelligence you know, intelligence uh, groups, um, and we'll provide a whole range of job codes and jobs, uh, job descriptions, and all that information comes from national market pricing survey data, uh, and we get averages throughout the country, and then we set up three regions, uh, three costs of labor, three cola regions throughout the country. So those in New York City or higher cost of living have a different set of salary, salary ranges. Those in the lower cost of living area, perhaps like Florida, have a, a lower cost of living range, salary ranges. And then if those in the middle, um, perhaps Washington, D.C. area, Washington, D.C. area, and some others uh, are mid-range. Um, and we have a separate set of ranges for those. So national market pricing survey data just allows allows us to come up with an infrastructure that takes a look at what other companies are doing, are doing, what they're paying their people for the similar kind of job titles and, and providing a compliant infrastructure that companies can then use to build their business on and also to then charge the government back to uh, with regard to their rates is concerned. And it's particularly critical for companies that for the DCAA reporting as well because the two regulatory the two regulatory requirement agencies are DCAA and OFCCP. DCAA is primarily concerned with how much are you charging the government? Are you overcharging the government for your services or for your product? OFCCP is predominantly concerned with whether or not you're paying your employees um, equally or if there's a disparate impact with regard to how you're paying your people. Um, so those are the two different uh, agencies that really are looking into what you're paying and why. Claire? All right. Thank you so much, Jim. We've come to the end of our time today. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to spend with us today. We hope you found value in the content provided. If you liked this webinar, please tell your colleagues on LinkedIn. Our goal at Jernix is to help our customers intelligently invest their time and resources to achieve per person, per project profitability. Should you have additional questions or would like to see a more in-depth view of our Jernix solution, our contact information is right here just for that. Don't forget to register for one of our other government contracting and DCAA webinars and stay tuned for our April webinars. We hope that all your projects are successful. Have a great day.